Um, so when did you decide to run? Um, actually, as the premiership of Boris Johnson was coming to a close and uh, became obvious, I uh, looked around the table, uh, looked around the party, and I thought that there's probably three things that we'll need in order to both win the next election and lead the country. We're going to have to have complete competence, we're going to have to be able to communicate, and we're going to have to be able to campaign. And when I thought about what I've done in the parts, um, including helping to win the 2015 election when I was party chairman, uh, the way that I've taken quite an unruly department, <laughs> Department for Transport, didn't always have the best press, it was often the news for the wrong reasons, uh, and uh, run it very, I, I hope people agree, competently, uh, I think, actually, I can use the same approach with the country and uh, improve Britain. I think our best days lie ahead, and I think I'm the person to deliver that. OK. Um, I'm keen to talk a bit more about your pitch, a bit more about yourself uh, mm. as the interview um, goes on. But just to talk about the last week, because it's been pretty mm. extraordinary. You've obviously had a bit of a ringside seat to it. You went in to tell Boris Johnson, frankly, that he didn't have the numbers. What, what happened? Yeah, I mean, look, I always think that the, the best thing to do is be completely candid and just, you know, say it as it is. And um, I could see that, uh, you know, things were coming to uh, a, a close. I, I didn't want him to be... I mean, I think the, the, one of the problems is being a leader. Eventually, you get people around you who'll just tell you what you want to hear. And I just wanted to make sure that he was getting the facts. Uh, and, and, and that was my conversation uh, with him. And he uh, listened carefully and, and, as we know, the next morning um, said that he would, he would stand down. Did you think it was part of the, the reason, then? Yes, I think, I mean, the, it's presenting the reality, so yes, um, of course. And what was his mood like? Um, actually, on the evening that I saw him, he was still quite uh, buoyant and, um, you know, I, as I say, you know, he, he was always looking for... Um, and, and for him, I think it was a question of public service. He, he's a huge kind of drive to sort of, but we've still got so much to do, he was saying, and, and I said, that, that's, that, that's right, but, you know, I've always been straightforward, given you the, the, the numbers as I see them, and I, I just don't think that's going to be possible. I think that, you know, one way or another, and it's been endlessly debated many times on your programme, despite all the brilliant things um, that he was able to do, in, including um, progressing and, you know, with, with Brexit, uh, where the country had already decided and sourcing it out, and the way that we were the first country in the world to put a, a vaccination an authorised vaccination in, in, in someone's arm, Margaret Keenan's arm, and come out of coronavirus lockdowns, the first as well, and all the rest of those things, his leadership in Ukraine, despite all of that, the problems within um, his uh, government, and particularly the operation of Number 10, were just insurmountable. What do you mean by the operation of Number 10? Well, clearly the parties were just, you know, in the end, um, uh, you know... We were all locked down. We are all having to... I couldn't see my dad for four months, as I've t told you before, and uh, he was in hospital and, uh, uh, you know, thought we'd lost him. And, uh, you know, in the end, um, it, those who make the laws have to live by the laws, and I think that just made it impossible. It's interesting, because I've obviously interviewed you, mm. you know, throughout the COVID pandemic mm. quite a lot of times. You're often the person going out on the most difficult weeks, to be frank. It must be quite hard to defend. I mean, Speaking so, to you now, you, you, yeah. You're more I mean, look, I'm, 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 I'm free to tell you, obviously, exactly what uh, I think. Uh, if you're in a government, you have something called collective responsibility in the cabinet. Uh, you have to make um, decisions around that cabinet table, and then the agreement is you stick to those decisions, or you shouldn't be in cabinet. And there was obviously, a, you know, a huge number of things this government has been um, doing from tackling a global pandemic for which there was no textbook, there was no rule book. We, we had to, you know, first time in 100 years there's been a pandemic like this and we had to, you know, essentially make it up as we went along. And I think actually overall, given the speed of the vaccine rollout, we did a yeah. very good job. But, but, but um, you know, my head was down in the department and, you know, looking after transport and everything else. Um, but, you know, I think I said at the time, and I repeat it now, of course I was hugely uneasy about... Uh, you know, having to, uh, to, to to talk about things which I was uh, uncomfortable with, not least because of my own family experience. Did I think on balance that that necessarily overruled the really great things that were happening? Uh, no. Um, I, I actually thought we were doing so many good things, particularly latterly okay. with Ukraine, mm. um, that, I, that, that I wasn't, you know, unlike... Um, you know, some of my colleagues came to the conclusion it was over. I, I, I didn't think it should be. Do but... you think um, 
Boris Johnson's a man of integrity. You know what, actually, like all of us, he's fundamentally flawed. But we all are, as human beings, right? Well, well, no in one. different ways, perhaps. Yeah, in different ways. I think, actually, you know, one of his um, uh, failings was he was sort of almost too loyal to, to people, and we saw a succession of people who he would defend. Like Chris then, Pincher, for example. Well, um, Pincher, um, you know, um, people would have said Cummings and, and, and other people. Uh, uh, but, but uh, you know... In the end, um, he was also quite brave. He'd take decisions that, you know, I think other politicians would have perhaps said, is I, I that guess, brave or is that reckless? And, I, I guess, and um, that is always the decision or that the, the, the quality of decisions is then really under you, the spotlight. You say that it was about, you know, showing loyalty to people. And mm. Some would say that that's quite a positive spin to put on it when mm. actually it's, it's... Integrity is also about your relationship to truth and being frank with people. Yeah, and, and look, I mean, I think there's no doubt there are differences. Uh, there are times when... You know, if I had been Prime Minister, I would just have come to a different decision. Um, as, as I say, I think, you know, in many ways it's brilliant, in some ways it's flawed. Actually, you know, everyone have, has the, the, the pluses and minus history. will okay. judge that in the round. Um, in the Sunday Times today, you said, I haven't spent the last few turbulent years plotting or briefing against the Prime Minister. I have not been mobilising a leadership campaign behind his back. Who are you talking about? No, no, no one in particular. No, no, no. Come no. on. No, there are people who um, have, for quite some time, wanted the Prime Minister um, to, to go. Many of them are on the back benches and not been plotting leadership campaigns. So who has been plotting a leadership campaign then um, from Cabinet? Well, look, I, I, I just simply am not going to get into... You can't, as you, you can't me say to. that... I'm not I just inviting you, I'm going on what you no, said I, I in the Sunday it was, Times. It was entirely intended uh, to be a positive campaign, a, a positive comment about my campaign, which is I've looked after my department, I've had my head down, I've run it competently. So you're I've not talking with, about Rishi Sunak? I'm not, no, I'm not, actually. And I think Rishi's a great guy. I think all these candidates, actually, as I just heard uh, Tom say, I think all the candidates, we've got an, almost an embarrassment of good quality candidates, and I simply am not going to get okay. into attacking them. I like all of the candidates, Rishi included, a lot. All I would say is my work has been, you know, dealing with things like the, the Kent lorry crisis where Macron closed the border, calling in the army, fixing that, dealing with the biggest repatriation this country's had since Dunkirk when Thomas Cook went down, uh, looking after the HGV crisis where we had that fuel crisis at our petrol station. That's what I've been doing in my department, head down doing that. Now we're on a leadership contest. I want to point out to people that I think I can communicate to the country. I think that I can uh, run a very competent ship number 10, uh, okay. and I think I can campaign. I think I can win uh, my colleagues, who are the electorate immediately, their seats. Well, let's let's talk about your colleagues, shall we? You obviously missed a spreadsheet. Um, you correctly predicted the number of people who would uh, back Boris Johnson in his leadership campaign. You got, I think, the confidence vote just won out. So your spreadsheet's algorithm is pretty good. What does your spreadsheet tell you about whether you're going to get to the next round, honestly? Uh, well, I think I, I will, obviously. Otherwise, I wouldn't be um, sat What here. does the spreadsheet uh, well, say? Well, and I hope you'll forgive me. I'm not going to go into, like... I, I, well, um, for you to say, obviously, but I think what viewers love to hear about is my plan for the country, how I think we can make ourselves the biggest economy by 2050 and help lift Which everybody we will, we will get in to that you. process. I'd love to talk about but those you, things. You, you, I don't want to sort of go you, into spreadsheets. But you, got, you, got, you think you've got the numbers? But clearly I wouldn't be here if I didn't think that was the okay. case. OK. Uh, right, let's talk about policy. Mm. Uh, you served both David Cameron and Boris Johnson. Yeah. What is your ideology? Yeah. So, I look, I believe in a lower tax, uh, lower regulation, cut the red tape uh, economy, uh, where people are free to... Uh, to where, where the government essentially actually lowers the barriers for individuals and businesses to achieve the, the best possible uh, things they can in their, in their own lives. And I think the, the role of the government is to help with that, uh, but sometimes that means reducing taxes, it means being able to uh, reduce red tape, make it easier to deal with government, get on with your life, start a business, bring up a family, bring up children... And that's what I, what, I, what I want to do, and within a framework, within a long-term plan of making this uh, the, the best economy uh, in Europe by 2050, the, the largest economy in Europe, which is a big ask, and we need a plan to get there. Uh, let's talk about taxes. What taxes specifically do you want to come down? Well, look, I think the very first thing, we are in a cost-of-living squeeze, and I think the uh, reduction, which is already planned, uh, 1p off uh, the income tax rate, the basic rate, that should happen now. If I become... A Prime Minister will have an emergency budget, we'll introduce that uh, immediately. I also want to uh, stop, uh, freeze, if you like, uh, the proposed increase in corporation tax. If we're going to rebuild this economy, if we're going to you know, beat the rest of the world that it is at work, if we're going to create the jobs that we need, the high-tech jobs, we, we, we cannot 
send the signal to business that you're not welcome here. And uh, so that is, a, that is a tax which will not go up. And I'll pay for all of this by making sure we cut the cost of the state. OK, that's interesting, because it does feel like, at the minute, in these leadership contests, everyone has talked about tax cuts, mm. corporation tax cut, national insurance, mm. and it's expensive. So you are being open that you would cut spending in order to do that? Yes. I mean, look, we, our, our government spending, just to put this in, is £1.2 trillion a year, right? And it's gone up... Yeah, but that pays for an awful lot of things. Of course it does. Ranked, of course it, it does. Like... But it's gone up because of um, coronavirus. In fact, you know, uh, I mean, last year, public spending was, um, I think, 52%, over 50% of GDP. And, and, and what the danger is, that it never quite comes down again. And so it never gets you, down. where would you cut then? Well, Gordon Brown, even, even Gordon Brown, I should say, used to say that, you know, public spending should be no more than about 40% of the economy. So wh GDP. Wh where would you cut? Because this is where we get yeah, the of sense course, of... Yeah, of course. Well, let, 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 let me just sort of give you some examples. There are nowadays many more efficient ways of doing things. So um, to take my own area of, of, of transport, uh, there are still 60,000 pieces of paper a week being sent to the... DVLA agency that look after people's driving licenses and the like. We, you know, that takes a lot of administration, a lot of bureaucracy. You can lower costs by using technology. You can't the size lower. Of, I mean, I'll just I give mean, you one we, we, simple we, example. I understand, can, but you, it, it you just can, feels like you know, just by saying efficiency savings, mm -hmm. this is what everyone talks about. No, We're talking no, no. Billions and billions here. Uh, You're going to have to make some uh, difficult and potentially controversial yeah. choices in spending but, if you want to pay for it. But here's spending. the thing. Again, Department of Transport. Department for Transport. We have five and a half thousand people working there now. In 2016, it would have been half of that size. Now, we've had to deal with, you know, the upshot and costs of, of, of Brexit and dealing with all of that. We've had to deal with coronavirus, dealing with all of that, I, you know. But there must come a point, as a government, and this will be the case across all government departments, where you sort of say, hold on a minute, what's going on? In 2016, people weren't saying government isn't big enough. Uh, and so it's now twice the size. Give, give, give us a, a, a meaty proposal where you'd cut spending. Yeah, so, well, let's start with the size of the civil service and government. I would certainly look to reduce the cost of doing government. I think that's really important. So you'd sack civil servants? Well, in, in, you partly do this through attrition, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, sacking sounds very, very, very harsh, but you, you, know, you simply stop employing people in, in post. You allow the thing to, to come down. Another great example, again, from my area, sorry, that's obviously things that I, I am very invested in. I am at the moment in the process of taking on the RMT, the union who still operate under rules from the 50s and 60s. One case, a rule from 1919, which is that you can't necessarily ask people to drive on, on a Sunday. And in doing so, we overman um, some of our public services in some ways which aren't even safe. So in the case of maintenance, for example, rather than using technology, trains that could do a much better job with 70,000 images a minute on the railways or checking the railways. Instead, we have people go along and walk along the railways. I'm, I'm interested. And that's you're dangerous. You're and about it's over -manning. overmanning, overmanning mm. public services. Mm. So do you think that is across the, across the board in, in lots of different public services? So I, do, so I do think across certainly government departments, certainly the agencies that I'm most familiar with. But there is one area which I would expand, uh, and that is the army, the military. Because uh, in my view, I, we're paying the cost for years of skimping along just barely getting to the 2% sometimes of uh, defence spending uh, as against our GDP when our NATO commitment is, as, as you know, 2%. I think we need to put that up to 3%. I think we're paying the cost in the war in Ukraine for not having done that. And whatever else we do under a Schaps administration, we will make sure that we are paying for our defence and not skimping on it. OK. Um, are trans men men and are trans women women? Well, first of all, I should say, if... Uh, if there's a Shaps administration, I'm Prime Minister, I will not be spending most of my time on these kind of um, issues. I think we owe everybody love and respect. I, uh, ha people should be able to get on and live their lives. There's clearly a biological uh, basis upon the, the, you know, your, the, your birth, uh, but when people want a gender, uh, transition gender, that is, uh, that is their choice and they, they'll always have the support uh, from me. As I say, I think the country is far more interested in things like their cost of living, um, the bread and butter issues, jobs and the rest of it. And so that's some of your, my I mean, some of your rivals are talking quite a lot about the war on woke. Do you think that's not actually where people's heads are at? Well, if, if people want a sort of uh, a, a PM who's talking about sort of the war on woke, well, or woke issues at all, it's just not me. Don't vote for me. I, I am interested in the bread and butter issues that your viewers would be thinking about every single day of the week. Uh, I, I am a 
libertarian, I'm, I'm liberal both um, economically, but also socially. Let, people, let them let live, let people live their lives. I just don't think we need to get caught up in some US style you know, debate and sort of almost sort of aggressive war uh, on these issues, it's just not necessary. OK. Um, now, you have had a couple of um, scandals, I think. Maybe is a bit too harsh a word, but at the same time, uh, there's certainly been um, some controversy around some of your time uh, in uh, office. In 2015, you quit as a minister after allegedly uh, failing to follow up allegations of bullying in the party when you were chairman. And, and this is you know, quite serious because it did lead potentially uh, to the suicide of a 21-year-old activist. Is that something you still think about? Absolutely, but I just must correct something yeah. there because there was a full uh, independent investigation into it. There's no uh, indication at all that I ignored mm -hmm. um, bullying. That's not what the investigation uh, did at all. And I actually resigned entirely as a matter of honour, as far as I was concerned. I wasn't party chairman when I resigned. It was, this was months later. Uh, I wasn't there when the bullying took place either. Uh, I was very frustrated, frankly, upset with the party at the time because the family of the, 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 uh, the individual who very sadly took his life were asking for answers. The party was sending in the lawyers rather than having a conversation. I was still a government minister, though this is, say, months later, I was in the Foreign Office and at uh, Department for International Development, and I was very upset and distressed that I couldn't just go and speak to them mm. because I was banned from doing so. I thought the honourable, decent, human thing to do was to resign, and I was pleased afterwards I was able to go and speak to the family, and I, I do not regret doing that, and, of course, I think about them all the time. OK. Um, you've had two experiences, two experiences in your life where, you know, you've perhaps been confronted by your own mortality. I was quite interested to read, you know, you were in a coma for a week after you had a car crash when you were 21. You were 29 when you were diagnosed with cancer. Had, have these experiences changed you, influenced you? Um, I, I, I was in a, uh, in a coma. I had a car crash I was in, in, in the States and a friend of mine um, was... A British friend of mine was driving and we ended up through the oncoming highway and, and, uh, and the car tumbling. Um, and I was, I was lucky to, to, to come through it. I was very pleased. I remember waking up from the coma. I was very pleased to be coming around. I knew something bad had happened, but not quite right. That must have been a strange right. experience. Very strange. And I can't remember the crash itself. Your brain just erases it. Um, but, you know, I made a full recovery. I think I may have been 20 rather than 21 at the time. I made a full recovery. And then, as you say, 10 years later, I had... Uh, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, it, anyone watching knows the day when you hear the news you've got cancer, it's like a scene in a film where the, everything stops around you and, you know, it just... You suddenly face this this brick wall. I'd just been selected as a candidate for my seat that I eventually went on to win, uh, well in Hatfield. Um, and I remember calling my party chairman and saying, I'm, I'm sorry, I think I probably have to stand. He said, well, let's speak about it in three months' time. And let's see how, you, how you're doing once you get into your chemotherapy. And like, Actually, we never spoke about it again. And obviously, the rest is, is history. Um, I was a year in chemotherapy and, and radiotherapy through to the end of that. But it was all before I, I, I came into politics. The strange thing is talking about it. It feels like I'm talking about somebody else's... You know, it, it, it's so long ago, it feels like a bad dream. Mm -hmm. but, but it was, as anyone who knows who's gone through these things, very significant. Mainly, actually, it meant that we would have to have children through IVF because of the chemotherapy, and, and all three of our kids are through IVF. So it had some big impacts uh, on our lives, of course. I bet. Um, I'm going to end, if, if I may, by doing a bit of a quickfire sure. uh, round. Uh, who's your biggest rival in the contest? Uh, I, I actually don't know. My spreadsheet's not even telling me that yet. So, look, let's just see how this develops. This is day one, so I think it's a little bit early to say. What, you... Come on, you're, you, I don't believe that. I just don't believe that your spreadsheet isn't telling you. <laughs> no, look, well, I think... it's not going to tell yeah, us what I, the spreadsheet I think says. there are lots of great candidates. Some haven't even launched, even people who are... Um, who, who have been talked about a lot haven't even launched yet. So let's see how this settles down. Okay. I'm confident I will be in the next rounds. I really... Think that I have a, a plan for this country. I think okay. we are, we are, we, we, we need that kind okay. of leadership, we, we, and I think I can offer of, it. Um, would Boris Johnson get a job in your cabinet? I don't think he'd want one. The answer's no. Have you ever done drugs? No. What was your first job? Uh, the first thing I ever did was to work for a company called Nashua, uh, later Gestetner, uh, and it's one of the things that led me into setting up a printing company 32 years ago. What's the naughtiest thing you've ever done? Uh, I've been terribly naughty, actually. Never. I haven't run through any <laughs> cornfields or anything else. I, I, you I'm, haven't I'm, even been naughty enough to run through a cornfield? I'm, I'm just not a sort of natural, uh, a, a natural rebel like, like that. No. Not like Theresa May? Not, like, not, not on that <laughs> edgy scale, no. Okay. OK, and what's your proudest moment? 
I think actually, uh, this is something that people don't know about, but I, I once set up a, um, a, an app which is called Street Link and it goes to this day. And what it does is enables people to, if they see somebody who's homeless, to enable them to come off the street and get the help and support that they require. I, I set that up more than 10 years ago when I was housing minister. And I was so proud the other day when I checked, it's helped thousands of people off the streets. And that's the sort of compassionate conservatism I like to see. Okay, great chaps. Thank you very much for being on the programme today. Thank you. Thank you.